This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to Man Library's Chats and Stacks book talk series. In today's talk, originally presented at Man Library on September 15, 2011, Donald Raykow, the Elizabeth Newman Wilds Director of Cornell Plantations and Director of the Cornell Graduate Program in Public Garden Leadership, talks about his latest book, Public Garden Management, which he's co-authored with Sharon Lee, editor of the journal Public Garden and former deputy director of the American Public Gardens Association. Raykow describes the diversity of public gardens that can be found in North America, their essential qualities, and the ways that public gardens are, now more than ever, playing a vital role in improving the quality of our lives and preserving biodiversity on our planet. Well, it's a real pleasure for me to be here and to have the opportunity to speak with all of you about what is certainly my favorite subject, public gardens. You know, when you write a book that is not a tell-all and is not a bodice ripper and, alas, is not much of a money maker, it's really gratifying when you get an opportunity to give a talk based on that book. But it's particularly gratifying for me to be giving a talk that commemorates the 10th anniversary of Chats in the Stacks. I actually attended Dave Wolf's first ever Chat in the Stacks lecture, which at that time truly was in the Stacks. Right, Janet? <laughs> and it's also very gratifying for me to give a talk in which I am literally nook looking out not only on all of your beautiful faces, but looking out on part of Cornell Plantations, uh, just beyond the windows of this building. So I feel truly at home here and am very pleased to talk about why we need public gardens more than ever. Now, it may seem odd to start a talk about public gardens by focusing on parks. But I want to draw a distinction between these two entities and by doing so, help to define what is a public garden. Public parks are wonderful places to walk along trails, to view natural wonders, to engage in sports or recreation, or simply to reconnect with nature. But while both public parks and public gardens share many of the same elements, they are distinctly different entities. So how do we distinguish between them? First of all, every public garden has, or certainly should have, a mission statement that defines their why, what, and who they primarily serve. So as you can see from this one example for Cornell Plantations, our why is to preserve and enhance diverse horticultural collections and natural areas. Our what is enrichment and education and in support of scientific research. And our who is the academic audience and general public. So in that one statement, we are able to define what we are, why we exist, and who we're doing it for. In my research on public gardens, I have only come across one public garden that does not have a mission statement, and no, I won't tell you which one it is. <laughs> But Betty, you and I were just speaking about it. <laughs> All public gardens should have collections of plants that are based on a purposeful strategy. That is, not plants that are randomly planted simply because they look pretty, but plants that contribute to the overall collections philosophy of that institution. One form of a purposeful collection approach is a taxonomic approach. So for example, 
Here we have the Bowers rhododendron collection on Comstock Knoll at Plantations, where all of the plants fit into the genus rhododendron or the broader family of the Ericaceae. A second type of purposeful collection approach is a thematic one. So here we see the Japanese garden in Portland, Oregon. The plants are not taxonomically related, but they're all related to the types of plants that are traditionally used in the creation of Japanese gardens. Other public gardens may base their collections approach on the use of natives only. And one good example of that is the Garden in the Woods of the New England Wildflower Society. Another example is the Mundy Wildflower Garden here at Cornell Plantations. So all of the plants in both cases are either natives to the region, and please don't ask me how we define natives, or are cultivars of those native plants. Now here's another really important distinction between public gardens and public parks. All public gardens must have strategies in place for managing their collections of plants and an approach to accessioning and deaccessioning the plants in their collections. Because after all, the plants in a public garden are the museum objects just as the paintings and sculptures are the museum objects in an art museum. Today, most public gardens use an electronic database to manage their accessions, like BG Base, which is the most popular program. Other people use Excel programs. But such databases provide information on the individual taxa, the individual plants, in the collection, as well as their origins, their Latin and common names, their location in, their, in the garden, and their condition. I remember when I first became involved with public gardens, the accessions would be kept on little file cards in metal boxes. We've moved beyond that. Also, to be successful, a public garden, excuse me, must have very highly trained and specialized staff. So whether it is an arborist taking down a dead tree, as you see here on the left, or an IPM specialist scouting in a greenhouse for white flies, public gardens must have the staff who will manage those collections as museum objects and in the manner that is most appropriate for their care. In addition, a public garden must be public. So there are individuals throughout North America who have fabulous private plant collections. But if those collections, if those properties are not regularly made open to the public, they are not public gardens. They're private gardens by invitation only. Interestingly, public gardens can include both not-for-profit and for-profit institutions. So while most public gardens are in fact not-for-profits, we also have institutions like Hershey Gardens, which is heavily supported by the Hershey Chocolate Fortune, and Bellagio Resort. Now, who would think that a major Las Vegas resort would be a public garden? But it meets the criteria that I've outlined. It has purposeful collections of plants. Those plants are accessioned and recorded and properly kept. It um, has highly trained staff, in fact, over 200 horticulturists on staff. So 
we are not able to discount uh, a Bellagio garden or a Bush Gardens or even a Disney World, believe it or not. So one more distinction is that many public gardens contain gardens and natural areas or preserves, but a public garden may not have only natural areas or preserves and no gardens. So a nature center is not a public garden. Next, I would like to talk about the types of public gardens. And there are a number of broad categories that define the types of public gardens in our field. The first of these are botanical gardens. Botanical gardens typically contain a wide variety of both herbaceous and woody plants. They will typically have varied educational offerings for audiences of different ages. And they will often, in many, many cases, have research programs that are focused on the development of new plant varieties or on conservation, on ecology, or on basic science. In contrast, to botanical gardens are arboreta. An arboretum is a type of public garden that focuses specifically on the display, evaluation, and care of woody plants, particularly trees and shrubs. Because many arboreta have large open expanses, publics may be inclined to treat such institutions as large parks with pretty trees and to use them for picnicking, frisbee, ultimate frisbee. Um, such activities may be appropriate in limited numbers, but the curators of that arboretum really need to keep their primary focus on the collections and on the programs, not on the Arboretum as a recreational site. A third type of garden is the pleasure garden. Now, one can say, don't all public gardens provide pleasure? And my response, of course, would be absolutely. But a pleasure garden is a specific type of garden where the focus really is on the use of plants, and the use of design to provide an aesthetic and uplifting experience. And one of the premier pleasure gardens in the US is Chanticleer in Wayne, Pennsylvania, uh, the former estate of the Bloom Garden uh, family. And it is a garden dedicated to providing a sensual experience and boy, does it do that. A fourth category I'd like to speak about is the historic site. Now, there are many historic sites that certainly are not public gardens. But those historic sites that have endeavored to either restore or to maintain an historic landscape and to accession and manage the plants that make up that landscape are truly public gardens. One of the real challenges for historic landscapes is determining what period to restore to if that estate has existed for 150 years do you restore it to 1875, 1900, 1925 what are the criteria that are used in making that decision? And then, how do you find the plants that were present at that time? That can be one of the most challenging aspects of restoring an historic landscape. 
As the zoological world has transformed from the way I knew it as a child of individual animals pacing in cages to the creation of ecological zones or habitats with a multitude of, of fauna in them, there has been a much stronger emphasis on the um, use and management of plants in those restored habitats. And in fact, there is now a subset of the American Zoological Association called the Association of Zoo Horticulturists, people who work at zoos whose professional focus is just on plantings. Those plantings can serve two primary functions. One is to contribute to that sense of naturalness of the plantings so that as you're viewing the animals, it gives the sense of viewing them in their real habitats. The other is that at zoos like the San Diego Zoo, which is world renowned, the plantings become an attraction in themselves. In fact, the San Diego Zoo conducted a survey of visitors uh, several years ago in which they found that 40% of visitors visit primarily for the plants rather than the animals. And you can just imagine how gratifying that is to the likes of me. <laughs> so next I'd like to talk about why do we create public gardens. And there are as many reasons for creating public gardens as there are the entities who create them. One reason to create a public garden is when a municipality is focused on a particular neighborhood or area in their city or town and views the public garden as having the potential of improving the surroundings around that garden. And I'm going to see if I can use this as a laser pointer. And I suspect the answer is no. So I'll just point, uh, use the old fashioned way. This is the neighborhood around the Garfield Park Conservatory. And in the lower right, you can see a inset of how that conservatory looks today. About 10 years ago, the city of Chicago was disturbed about the degraded conditions of the neighborhood around Garfield Park and decided that by restoring the conservatory and its associated gardens, there could be a ripple effect into that neighborhood. And in fact, that is exactly what has happened. In the neighborhood around Garfield Park Conservatory, crime has been decreased, vacancy has been decreased, drug and alcohol abuse has been decreased. So simply by making the garden and conservatory a major attraction, it has helped to bring up that entire neighborhood and is often used by the city of Chicago as an example of green renovation. And the former mayor of Chicago, say what, you, what else you might about him, Richard Daly, was a tremendous proponent of green infrastructure. Colleges and other academic institutions develop public gardens on their campuses for a number of reasons, to support uh, plant-related research, to complement the curriculum by serving as living laboratories, to support the university's outreach mission, to provide a competitive edge for potential faculty, staff, and students, to serve as a unifying design force as the Scott Arboretum does for Swarthmore College, and as I always like to point out, to serve as a place for cheap dates for students. Now for many colleges and universities, 
their public garden is unfortunately a considerable distance away from the central campus as the beautiful Minnesota Landscape Arboretum up in Chanhassen is about 20 miles from uh, Minneapolis where the main campus of the University of Minnesota is, land is located. As I've already pointed out, I'm looking at Cornell plantations, so we have the distinct advantage of having our botanical garden, our arboretum, many of our natural areas immediately adjacent to campus. Not-for-profit organizations or visionary individuals also create public gardens for a number of reasons. One is to provide a botanical locus, an actual physical location for organizations to help them carry out their mission. In the upper left, you see the spectacular Chicago Botanic Garden. The Chicago Horticultural Society was established back in the 1890s, but they existed just in a building until the 1970s when they opened the Chicago Botanic Garden on a series of islands in North Chicago. Now they have an incredible location in which they're able to truly fulfill their horticultural mission. Individuals also create public gardens to carry out their personal mission or passion. Pierre S. DuPont in 1906 purchased um, the property that became Longwood Gardens. Initially, as I teach my students, DuPont purchased and developed that property for incredibly egotistical reasons. He wanted it to put on lavish parties with musicians and dancing girls and tableau vivants, but the reactions that he got from his various guests to the developing Longwood Gardens were so positive that DuPont eventually recognized that an even greater calling would be to create this as a public garden. And now we know Longwood Gardens as the premier display garden in the U.S. And um, those of us who were able to attend the American Public Gardens Association conference this past summer and attend the dinner and gala at Longwood Gardens felt like we were being feted just like back in Pierre's day. So the impetus of individuals to create public gardens is not always as egotistical or as money-based as it was for Pierre S. DuPont. Sometimes it is to bring out more of an educational or research mission. And in 1927, Susanna Bixby Bryant, who was a passionate student of the flora of Southern California, created Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden as a site for research and study of the native Xeric flora of that region. And Rancho Santa Ana now has very close associations with the Claremont Colleges and actually provides or serves as a site for much of the graduate education at the Claremont Colleges. I'd like to now turn our attention to some of the significant trends that exist in public gardens today. Public gardens are actively involved with reaching beyond our traditional audiences through our programs, collections, and outreach. Today's public garden has become a center for art, for conservation, for research, for outreach, and in fact, for healing. 
In this next section, I'd like to delve into some of the ways in which public gardens are remaining relevant to their audiences by truly responding to the needs of their publics. It should not come as a surprise to anyone in this audience that globally we are facing a major crisis in plant diversity loss. Uh, by 2050, we could lose or be on the verge of losing one-third of all known plant species based on research done by the esteemed Dr. Peter Raven from the Missouri Botanical Garden. Public gardens are addressing this threat to biodiversity through organizations such as the Center for Plant Conservation. This is a consortium of 36 public gardens, including Cornell plantations, that are dedicated to maintaining extant populations of rare and endangered species of their regions. Each of the participant gardens in the CPC is assigned one or more species that they are specifically responsible for managing. In the case of plantations, it is the species Trolleus laxus that we looked at in the previous slide. We manage our populations of Trolleus laxus by harvesting seed from the extant plants each year, germinating those seeds in our greenhouses, growing on the seedlings, and then setting those seedlings back out into their native sites the following year. Uh, CPC also provides a tremendous amount of education and limited financial support to the institutions that are part of the CPC network. A more global network is Botanical Gardens Conservation International. BGCI, as it's known, is an organization that exists to ensure worldwide conservation to threaten plants, the continued existence of which are intrinsically linked to global issues including poverty, human well-being, and climate change. Their mission is to mobilize botanic gardens and engage partners in securing plant diversity for the well-being of people and the planet. And they are a wonderful organization. One of my graduate students in the Public Garden Leadership Program is currently on leave doing an internship with them in England. I'd like to talk about some of the ways in which we public gardens are contributing to a sense of social justice by responding to the needs of local communities. It's not a hidden secret that traditionally the demographics of visitors to public gardens trended mostly toward white, mostly middle-aged, and mostly middle-class individuals and families. Increasingly, however, public gardens are endeavoring to understand the needs of audiences around them and to address those needs and to respond to the issues that community leaders bring to them. One way that public gardens can respond to social needs is by developing exhibits, collections, or special events that respond to particular cultural traditions or holidays. Through such activities as the annual Chili Festival, and Sakura Matsuri Cherry Blossom Festival, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden celebrates the diverse ethnic groups that make up the amazing borough of Brooklyn, New York. You know, just as a slight aside, 
I love when you go over the Brooklyn Manhattan Bridge and you see a sign that says, Brooklyn, New York, believe the hype. <laughs> That's a proud borough. And speaking of a proud borough, BBG, or Brooklyn Botanic Garden, also recognizes that when residents contribute to the care of their communities, they become more invested in all aspects of the health and safety of those areas. So this philosophy led to the formation of the greenest block in Brooklyn, in which groups of residents and businesses compete to produce the most beautiful streetscapes and win cash prizes and recognition. And as you can see from this image, some of those community groups take that challenge very seriously. The Chicago Botanic Garden, which I mentioned earlier, works closely with the urban community to offer a program called College First. It's a dynamic paid internship in which eligible Chicago public high school students um, participate in career mentorship, field ecology courses, conservation science, and college preparatory and assistance programs. The emphasis is placed on entry and success in college as a pathway to career success. CBG also offers the Green Youth Farm Program, which offers up to 60 high school students instruction and hands-on activity in all aspects of organic farming, from sowing seeds to marketing their produce. CBG even has a similar program in cooperation with the Cook County Department of Corrections to instruct inmates on growing vegetables. So talk about a captive audience. A wonderfully authentic example of celebrating a native culture is the First Nations Garden at the Montreal Botanical Garden. This garden was conceived, designed, and constructed with involvement from many of the members of the indigenous tribes of Quebec and serves as a site for ceremony and cross-cultural understanding. And as you might imagine, I visit many, many public gardens, and this First Nations garden was one of the most inspiring I have ever seen. It's important that all visitors to a public garden feel welcome as soon as they enter that garden. Now, one way to accomplish this is to translate wayfinding and interpretive signs into the prevalent language or languages of the local community, as the Queen's Botanical Garden has done with their touchscreen kiosk. And I don't know if you can see, but that is in Spanish, and with much of their signage. And this is in Korean, and the Flushing neighborhood around the Queen's Botanical Garden has a very large Korean population. In fact, Queen's New York has more ethnic groups in it than any other county in the country. So Queen's Botanical Garden has responded to that diversity by celebrating it and by making every effort possible to make their visitors feel welcome. When I speak with my students about barriers at public gardens, the first thing that comes to mind is physical barriers, and we'll talk about that a bit later. But a barrier that isn't necessarily intuitive is admission fees. And many public gardens, in order to maintain their programs and collections, charge a pretty substantial admission fee. One way around that 
is by having free days. But what I've learned in speaking with the directors of public gardens that do charge admission is that free days can be overwhelming for staff. So many people may come in that the staff are just not prepared to accommodate such crowds. So what many public gardens now do is hand out free day admission passes through area churches, schools, and WIC sites. Moving now from social justice issues that are on more of the local or regional level to national concerns. And we certainly have a multiplicity of challenges as a society today, many of these challenges being addressed by public gardens through their educational and outreach programs. One of these challenges has to do with sustainability. Now that is a much used, perhaps overused term, and there are many different ways of thinking about sustainability. But one definition that most people will agree to is from the 1991 Brundtlin Commission, which defined sustainability as development that meets the need of one generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. One public garden that is truly leading the charge in sustainable development is the Phipps Conservatory and Botanical Garden. Phipps has utilized the most progressive engineering in developing their new visitor center and new tropical greenhouse. But what is most exciting is their new Phipps Center for Sustainable Landscapes. This building, which is due to be completed next spring, will be one of the world's first certified living buildings. It will produce 100% of its own energy, and it will capture and treat all of its own water on site, thereby meeting and, in fact, exceeding the highest green standards of the Green Building Council. So this is truly an achievement, and the FIPS is to be applauded on the resources that they have devoted to becoming the greenest public garden in America. In Pittsburgh. Thank you, Howie. While the achievements at Phipps are truly laudable, most visitors to public gardens are really most interested in what they can do in their own properties and own landscapes to be more sustainable. A couple of practices that we have adopted at Cornell Plantations are on more of a residential adoptable scale. One of these is we've traded in, actually dumped, our large full-size or three-quarter ton pickups and have replaced them with a series of Japanese manufactured mini trucks that serve our needs very well and get an astounding 50 miles to the gallon. Over time, our goal is to even replace these mini trucks and go entirely with electric vehicles once those become more available. For many, many years, Cornell Plantations purchased thousands of dollars of shredded hardwood mulch that had to be trucked from considerable distance to plantations. Another sustainable technique that we have adopted is to serve as a dumping site for all of the leaves from the village of Cayuga Heights. These then are mixed with waste wood, which is run through a very large chipper called a tub grinder. And we now take that mixture of 
leaves and wood chips, blend them in a particular ratio, and that's what we're using 100% as our mulch on all of the beds throughout plantations. Another social issue that public gardens are addressing is what was first termed by the journalist and author Richard Louvre as nature deficit disorder. Um, Louvre and many of his associates have pointed out that young people are increasingly divorced from the natural world as their lives are dominated by video games, by frequent testing, and by, in many cases, urban blight. This disconnect has been shown to cause such problems as reduced ability to concentrate, increases in asthma and related lung disorders, and of course, our national epidemic of obesity. Public gardens are addressing these nature deficit disorder related issues through programs like Let's Move Museums and Gardens. Under the leadership of First Lady Michelle Obama, Let's Move programs endeavor to engage young people in their, and their families in lively, active activities that will keep them more robust, more connected with nature, and in better shape. Cornell Plantations ran its first Let's Move event last month, and despite a rainstorm, we were able to attract 70 kids and their parents to take hikes through the Arboretum. And we're going to be following that up with a series of Let's Move events that are focused both on remaining active and establishing delicious and nutritious diets. Horticultural therapy is an approach in which plants are used to improve the quality of life for all people. The Enid Hopp Glass Garden at Rusk Institute of NYU Medical Center has been a leader for over 40 years in working on therapeutic programs for those recovering from surgery, those with physical limitations, and those with mental or psychological conditions. As is stated on the website of the American Horticultural Therapy Association, quote, the therapeutic benefits of peaceful garden environments have been understood since ancient times. In the 19th century, Dr. Benjamin Rush, a signer of the Declaration of Independence and considered to be the father of American psychiatry, reported that garden settings help, excuse me, garden settings held curative effects for people with mental illness. Well, ultimately, public gardens are places that visitors, regardless of their age, their ethnicity, or even their abilities, can delight in the beauty of nature and the remarkable ways in which we humans can work with plants. In an urbanized, high-stress, and uncertain society, don't we need such institutions now more than ever? Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.